You know, being on, a worship, on the worship team is really a selfless act because <clears throat> it takes a lot of time. Uh, they're here every Wednesday, first of all, um, and then they are always, they got meetings that are happening. They have other things that they're doing, like on Friday nights, and they have to be here. How early are y'all here, usually? On, uh, on the celebrations. So you're here at 5 on Saturday nights. What time are you here on 8.30 on Sunday? They're the diehards. No, but for real, worship team, we really do love you. Thank you for what you do and giving of yourselves um, to, in many ways, show us what it means to worship. Um, I think, I don't know about you, but I know I've spent a lot of my time in, in worship over the years, and it's, it's almost more like a Christian cheerleading session <laughs> than it is worship, you know? And I'm guilty of that because I've led worship for like over a decade, and it was like, all right, everybody raise your hands. Give me an A. Give me an O, you know? And it's like, man, just worship, you know? And I love that our worship team does that. They just worship. And whether or not we want to join them, they're just like, we're going. And I just love that. And I think I'll say this too. Um, I think some of the most powerful times that I've experienced in worship have been not when the worship team, like, nails all their notes um, or hits all the right beats. Sam, I know you don't know what that's like. You always hit the right beats, especially those syncopations. They're sick, bro. Actually, during worship, I felt like Jesus was like, Sam, I love your beats. So that's, that's pretty sweet. I was like, would he say that? Like, I love your beats? Anyway, he invented music. He can say whatever he wants, right? Um, but I think some of the most powerful times in worship have been when the worship team is doing their thing, but collectively there's a passion and a hunger where, like, everybody in the room decides to throw caution to the wind, and we've all come for one reason, and we're just going to worship our hearts off. And I just think those times, honestly, have been when worship has been the most dynamic and that I've seen. And uh, anyway, so I guess I also want to thank you, church, for, for always coming amped up and ready to worship, no matter how you're feeling, no matter what the weather's like, no matter what season we're in. You show up, and you love God, and you just want to worship him. And honestly, a lot of the times we, were, we have precious encounters with God, it's because of your worship. And so we're really thankful for you. Um, we worship for a long time, and you could easily just check out, but you don't. In fact, probably many of you wish we could go longer. <laughs> uh, so you're really the diehards, and we're really thankful f- uh, for you. Um, so speaking of that, um, I was going to share this at the end, but I think I'll share it first. I had a dream this week, um, and I just figured I'd share it with you. What do you think? Um, you know, I... Uh, Okay, I got to give you some necessary context first. Otherwise, you might think I'm a weirdo. In fact, you might think I'm even more of a weirdo when I give you the context, but whatever. So we have a fluffy golden retriever. Uh, Her name is Vera, and I emphasize fluffy because that girl sheds everywhere. I mean, you get nose on your shirt, your pants, up your nose, everywhere. Um, You'll be brushing your teeth, and it's on your toothbrush. It's like, what are you, how did you get here? It's in a cupboard. Anyway, um. So, yeah, do you? Does anybody else know what I'm talking about? The Meltons and I and, oh, the Walkers. I know you guys know. Yeah, y'all have like 10 retrievers, right? Pretty soon, Dwayne, what do you think? <laughs> Don't say anything. Um, um, okay, so she's like super cuddly and everything. So, like, when, we're, when we see her, we, we, I don't know why, I guess we do this. Maybe it's just because she's so cute. But, like, we put our face in her face because she's just, she's soft and she's just cute, you know, and we're just like, we get up all up. We get all up in her grill, and she does the same to us. So we've kind of trained her to do that. So when people come over, she's our little evangelist and door greeter. You know, so if you ever come over and she puts her face in yours, she won't bite your face off. Uh, she'll lick your face off probably. Anyway, you're like, what? Why are you telling me that? Trust me. Okay. So uh, in the dream, we were all here in church, just like we are right now. How many know we're actually not in church? We're with church, right? So we were all with church. I need to correct my own grammar. <laughs> and uh, we were singing Yeshua. Has anybody ever heard of that one? So powerful song. It's all just the name of Jesus. And we were, I mean, it was one of those times where everybody in the room was just like belting. Like, you know when you kind of use your inside singing voice? And then sometimes you're at like a concert and your band's playing and you use your outside singing voice? Do you know what I'm talking about? Well, Everybody was using their outside singing voice. I mean, there were everybody was just going after all of us collectively. 
And we had noticed in the foyer that there was a lion, like, roaming in the foyer. I mean, literally just picture this. Like, imagine if a lion was roaming in the foyer. Kind of freaky. Maybe it wouldn't scare you. But in the dream, it was just normal and real. Like, it was like, guys, there's a lion in the foyer. Worship stopped, and we're like, whoa. What are we going to (laughs) do? And so we're all looking at it. I don't know who it was, but somebody was like, you know, we should probably let him in or something like that. And I'm like, naturally, I'm thinking that's that's such a dumb idea because the doors have an outswing. He can't get in unless we open the door. So we opened the door, and this big lion, big mane, I mean, it looked like Chronicles of Narnia lion, you know. Uh, What's his name? Aslan with a D or no? There is a D? (laughs) <laughs> Sam, <laughs> I think I've said Aslan, and then I've always been insecure about it, but I know well, you got my back now. So, But it, he looked just like Aslan, just big and majestic and beautiful. And there was this uh, female lion that was with him, and somehow in the dream I just knew that they were mates, you know. So they're just they're roaming, and we open the door, and he comes in. And he comes in, and it was like we were just so happy that he was in here. And so we're like we're petting him, and we're kind of cuddling him, and and I, like, put my face all up into his face like I do with Vera because he just looks so soft and nice, you know. And as I'm doing it, all of a sudden, something shifted in my heart, like caution flag. You ever have that? And I was like, oh, he's a lion. He might literally bite my face off. You know? <clears throat> so anyway, but so we're just we're engaging with this lion. So there was this mutual, like, awe and, and just love and, like, warmth. You know, like as if a golden retriever were to walk in. It was like that kind of warmth. But there was also a tremendous reverence in each one of us where we're like, hey, like let's not be too familiar because at any moment he might be hungry and he might look at Ron. What? <laughs> um, and that was the end of the dream. Um, and I think in the dream it was just very literal, you know, but how we know a lot of the times our dreams are very metaphoric. And uh, I think you can interpret that, Right. Um, but in case you're having a hard time with it, um, we were worshiping. And how many know when we worship, it's actually, your worship is an invitation to the Lord. So when you sing, despite when you feel it or when you don't feel it, um, despite all of the, you know, all of the elements that sometimes make us not want to worship, when you choose to, it's literally sending an invitation, almost like if you can picture millennials like a friend request, Okay. Like, you're, you're sending him an invitation to come. And oftentimes, I believe he comes, and all we got to do is just open the door and just let him come in. Even though it might be a little bit scary, even though he might challenge me, even though he might freak me out sometimes, even though he might make me tremendously uncomfortable, we got to let him in. Amen. Say, I'm going to let him in. Say, I'm going to let him in. I heard Reinhard Bonnke say today, he said, I, wa- I watched the coolest interview I've ever seen in my life. And it was with Reinhard Bonnke. Y'all know him? Okay, yeah, so, so good. Um, but he said, uh, in his German accent, he said, uh, You don't have to defend a lion. All you have to do is let him out. Because so, sometimes in worship, honestly, if I invite a friend or something and they come and maybe they haven't been around a culture like this, I'm like, Oh, no. You laugh because you know exactly what I'm talking about. Or even if you don't know the guy or if you don't know the girl and you see somebody new and they just look like a nice person and you're like, I hope I don't scare you. I hope you don't get freaked out. You you go talk to the people around them. Hey, don't speak in tongues today, okay? Just save that for next week, please. Thanks. (laughs) Right? Um, And so sometimes we honestly, it's like we think that we love that person more than God does. And we want to, like, protect them from an encounter. (laughs) You know what I mean? We don't think that way, of course. We're actually thinking in their favor and for them. But how many know we don't need to defend the lion? We just need to let him roar. That's all we need to do. But he roars when we worship. And in the dream, I thought it was powerful because the, the worship is what preceded all of it. Um, in, um, where is it? I think it's in Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews 4. Did I give you this one, Noah? If not, that's all right. Um, I'll just read it quick. This isn't my message or anything, but Hebrews 4, um, well, maybe it'll be coming. I don't know. 4, 14 through 16. Can I read it to you quick? 
I'm going to say, uh, seeing then that we have a great high priest, how many know he is great, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Sometimes we feel like Jesus beats us up for our weaknesses. He doesn't. He sympathizes. Somebody needs to hear that tonight. He sympathizes, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. Somebody say that word boldly. How many know it's not sheepishly, even though we're sheep? We are to come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Well, how do we boldly come before the throne? What is the password? What is the, how do we access his throne? How many know Psalm 22, 3? It says, yet you are holy, enthroned in the praises of your people. So how do we boldly come before the throne? We praise him. We just exalt him. We just worship him. You send him that friend request, right? And he's like, oh, I'm coming. Even if you're a bad singer, he likes it. Even if you sing off key, he likes it. Isn't that awesome? So, Lord, tonight we worship you all around this place. We don't need a keyboard. We don't need a singer. We don't need any sort of drums. We love the drums. But, Lord, we love you and we worship you right now all around this place. Even at home, God, we exalt you and we praise you. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Jesus, we love you. We love you. We throw caution to the wind tonight. Lord, we're not here to look pretty or to just smell good. We're here to exalt you. Lord, if you don't show up, we're just doing Christian stuff. No, we need the lion. We need the lion. So we open the doors of our hearts tonight and we welcome you to come, to come into Rome, to cuddle with us, yet to give us and show us and remind us how to revere you and how to fear you. Oh, we exalt you in this place. Just lift your hands all around this place and worship him. Jesus, we love you. We love you. We are not ashamed of you. We are not ashamed of you. We exalt you. Oh, without you, we are truly nothing. But with you, we have everything and we are everything. Oh, you are the bright and morning star. Oh, we love you. We love you. You are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. You are the Savior. You are the healer. You are the deliverer. You are the baptizer. Hallelujah. We exalt you, Jesus. We exalt you. Say, I love you, Jesus. You mean more to me than anything. You are my first love. Come and have your way. Speak to me tonight. My heart's wide open. My soul is wide open. I refuse to leave you the same. In the name of Jesus. Somebody shout amen. amen. Yes. Woo. The church is going to roar a little bit. All right, grab your Bibles if you haven't already. Mm, grab your Bibles. We better hold them up. Let's hold them up one time, huh? Let's see them. Let's see them. Let's see them. Hold up those swords. Here we go. Here we go. Say, this is my Bible. It's not just a history book, although it's the best history book. It is a living word. It's the only book on earth. That the, where the author lives inside of me. I have 24-7 access to the author. So if I ever have a question, I just ask him. And I open up this book. John, turn with me to John 15. Okay, so I'm just going to give you some context. What did I say, John what? 15, yeah, okay. We're going to go to John 15. <laughs> and uh, just so you know, these are some of Jesus' last words. Uh, just to give you some context of, of what we're going in, I learned this from Pastor Bob. Sometimes I'd go into his office and I would have a question about one verse, say one verse. And I'd say, can you explain what this one verse means? And he said, sure, let's back up a little bit. And I'm like, how far are you thinking? He said, let's just go back. Um, let's go back to the beginning of the chapter. I'm like, okay, all right, that sounds fine. Go back to the chapter. He's like, actually, tell you what, let's go back a few more chapters. I'm like, wait, 
I just had a, I just had a question about this verse. He said, I know. Let's go to the very beginning. Let's go to Genesis 1. <laughs> Actually, Jake, are you saved? Let's just start there. And I'm like, I was just wondering if tongues was for today. That's all I was wondering. It's like you have to understand the context. How many know this book was written a long time ago, right? So anyway, um, he, this is all his fault. So anyway, in John 15, we're jumping in to um, basically the disciples. Right before this, in chapter 13, they had, uh, they had went over to this house, and they were having the, the Last Supper. So they're all sitting there, and this is where Jesus washed their feet and everything, and they ate, and they had a good time. Now, there were a lot of people there. How many disciples did Jesus have? He had 12 of them. Now, apparently, I didn't know this, but apparently at this time, in order for somebody to have this many people in their house, they'd have to be pretty wealthy. So they were believed to be in the upper class part of town. All right? So they're over there. They're in this pretty nice house with pretty nice things with probably pretty nice food. And Jesus washes their feet. They're having dinner. Now, he knows what's coming. Right? Does anybody else think otherwise? Like he was unaware and it caught him off guard. <laughs> no, no. He, he knew what was coming. And so how many know he realized, see, there was a Sermon on the Mount in the beginning of his ministry. Well, this is like the bookend to that. This whole, these whole chapters here. It's kind of like the Sermon at the Table, if you will. So you had the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through what, 8 or so? And then you've got the Sermon at the Table, John 13 through about 15. Now, once we get to 15, where it's kind of debated whether or not they're actually still in the house or if they're in the courtyard of the house or if they're on their way walking towards the Garden of Gethsemane. Are you with me? See, Bobby Connor said, when you read the Bible, put yourself in it. Put yourself in it. Understand what's happening. He must have talked to Pastor Bob. Thank you for coaching Bobby Connor, Pastor Bob. <laughs> He's literally laughing. He's like, no, no. <laughs> um, but he said, when you, when you read the Bible, literally put yourself in it. What's going on? He said, what, what's the temperature? What's the climate of, of the room? Are people tense? Are they happy? Are they unsure of who Jesus is? Do they know who Jesus is? All of these answers help paint the overall picture. And how many of you have sometimes they have a hard time reading the Bible, let's be honest. You get to Leviticus and you're like, what? <laughs> no idea what's going on. Yeah, it helps to put yourself in it. If you have a hard time, picture it. Just what does it smell like, you know? Are they outside? Are they inside? Is there a candle? Is there not, right? Are you with me? So it's evening time, um, and they're walking. And I, I don't know if they're walking through the streets. Most scholars believe they are kind of either at the table or in the courtyard still together because it would have been hard to have a group of 12 people at nighttime walking down the street having a very deep conversation. Um, and I, I guess I'm of that persuasion. So in John 15, that's where we jump in the story. They just had a nice candlelight dinner. It was really good. And, and, and again, I, I guess I'm not trying to meddle on this too long, but I do want to emphasize this is his last chance to speak as, as, a, as God as a man to his disciples. This is his last sermon that he gives to give them. It's a very intimate moment. This isn't thousands of people. This is just his key 12. Are you with me? It's almost like have you, uh, you ever, like, were dating somebody and you knew that the date was coming to, to the end and you're on the way home and you just knew, like, you're going to have to say goodbye soon? Like, oh, I'm going to have to say goodbye for the night. We didn't talk about that one thing I really wanted to talk about. Oh, we're about 20 minutes out. I think I might just try and squeeze this in there. Hey, do you like me? And you have that deep heart-to-heart, -heart, but it's kind of crammed in there. It's kind of rushed in, you know. This is not like that at all. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to read the Bible through your own lens, you know. But literally, how many know we're the bride? And this is his last opportunity to share something very important to us. And uh, so here we are in, uh, in John chapter 15. Are you ready? In verse 1, Jesus says, I am the true vine. How many know he's the true vine? How many know if there are true vines, then there must be a couple false ones? How many, now, if I can just, sorry, we just started reading. <laughs> I'm ADD. In fact, well, I don't know if ADD is the right word. No, my wife's like, no, that's not right. So I'm going to take that back. But I am a red light, green light reader. You ever played red light, green light? Remember that? Red light, green light, yellow light, green light, red light. 
That's like me. I'm reading, and then I stop, and I'm like, whoa, i got to read that again. Anyway. Squirrel is right. He is the true vine. That must mean there are false vines, yeah? So I'm, I'm literally thinking back to the garden right now. I'm just going to take you with me. I'm thinking of the garden, and I'm thinking about if we can just throw grammar, you know, out in the foyer with a lion for a minute. <laughs> um, just kidding. He's in here. Just throw it out there. In the garden, how many know there were a bunch of true vines? You could eat from any of these trees, any of these things. Eat from anything you want, right? Eat from anything you want. Have, have a time. It's all going to be good. How many know the world before sin entered it, before they ate of the, of, the, of the false vine? Nothing had been adulterated or unpurified. Everything was perfect. All of the fruit was awesome. No sin had corrupted the world. So there were a ton of true vines, but there was one false vine. And God said, surely if you eat of this tree, you will surely. Now, when they ate that fruit, it wasn't an apple, by the way. Most people believed it to be a fig. But when they ate that fig, did they die right away? They just fall over and end of Genesis. Did they? No. But why did he, but he said that they would die if they ate of it. How many know that they had a spiritual death? They had a spiritual death. Now, here's what's interesting. Now, today it's fascinating because back then there were a bunch of false vines and there was one true vine. But now, again, we're just kind of throwing grammar out there, okay? But now there is one true vine and there's a bunch of false vines. Right? And when we eat from a false vine, or furthermore, and I guess according to this, when we are connected or when we're abiding in a false vine, how many know there's no life in that? It's artificial. I wonder if there's anybody watching this or here tonight that maybe unintentionally you've been connected to a false vine. You've been wondering, why am I not bearing more fruit? I'm doing all the Christian things. I'm, I'm listening to Christian music. I'm listening to Christian podcasts. I'm reading Christian books. I'm going to Christian groups. I go to a Christian church. That's a good thing. Why am I not bearing better fruit? How many know those are all good things and we should do them? But we need to abide in the true vine. We need to abide in the true vine, and that is Jesus. He said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Are you okay tonight? Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. How many know pruning is for a purpose? He doesn't just prune you to hurt you. Some Christians, I've heard this, and I guess I've actually been guilty of it myself, where it's like, oh, the Lord's just pruning me right now. Oh, I'm just getting pruned. The Lord is stabbing me right now. How many know it's not? Like some sort of like, well, I guess I shouldn't say it's easy because it isn't ever. Um, but how many know it's, it's for a purpose? It's a good thing. I looked up this word prune, and I don't speak Greek, so I'm not going to try it. But it literally means this. If you wouldn't mind writing it down for those of you who take notes and are crazy faith people and don't want to miss a single thing God's speaking. <laughs> Pastor Bob told me a long time ago, he said, if you want to be successful, have one notebook, have one calendar, and one to-do list. Pro tip, pro tip, and one whiteboard. (laughs) Yep, okay, not interested. All right, here we go. Um, The word prune, it it means this, to make clean by purging, removing undesirable elements, hence pruned or purged. And watch this. It's eliminating what is fruitless by purifying. And it has in parentheses here, making unmixed. So so when he's pruning you, he's literally, he's making you unmixed. How many of sometimes we live in a world where we can get kind of mixed up, where it's not just Jesus. We get Jesus and we get a little bit of anxiety because we've been watching the news too much. Right? And he's like, I got to prune that. I got to unmix that. I got to get some of that out of you. Are you with me? In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, it says, Beloved ones, with promises like these and because of our deepest respect and worship of God, we must remove everything from our lives that contaminates body and spirit. Did you all catch that? We must, say must, we must remove everything from our lives that contaminates body and spirit. 
and continue to complete the development of holiness within us. How many know, this is, this is why we do the 40-day transition. Because it literally, if we're being honest, as Americans, we are hardwired. In fact, I would say as humans, we are hardwired for comfort. We're hardwired to not have to take too many risks, to be comfortable, right? I mean, think about it. All the decisions we make are, is that the most convenient thing for me or is that the most inconvenient thing for me? When you open Google Maps, do you, do you, or Google Ma- Google Maps. Do, when you open Google Maps, do you pick the longest, most inconvenient route, or do you pick the quickest one? You pick the quickest one, unless it has tolls, and you're like, I'm out, right? <clears throat> we are hardwired to pick and to go the easiest route, but how many know the way of God isn't always easy? So with the uh, with the 40 day transition, it's almost just like it's building a platform for people who are crazy enough to sign up for it. That it's like we're literally going to purge ourselves of all of these other things. No social media, no news, no sports, no none of this and none of that. All we're going to do is spend time with Jesus every day, and we're going to spend time in his word every day. We're going to read a book um, that is going to build my faith. We're going to spend time with each other. We're going to go to church. Are you with me? And I, and I think 2 Corinthians 7.1 is really powerful in articulating why we need to do that. We must remove everything from our lives that contaminates body and spirit and continue to complete the development of holiness within us. Mm, I had more, but let's go to verse 3 here. Um, John 15, verse 3. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. You know the number one way that God prunes us? What do you think it is? Any ideas? Not all at once. Not all at once. Respect each other. How does he prune us? I'll help you out. By speaking to us. By speaking to us. Have you ever thought this? I wish God would speak louder. Okay, see, the giggles give you away, right? Come on, how many have ever thought that? I wish God would speak louder. I wish God would just be a little, just speak a little bit more clearly for my simple ears. Anybody? Anybody at all? Okay, five of us are going to keep it real. I would like to propose something, and it's this. If we want to hear the voice of God more, it's not so much turning up the voice of God as much as it is turning down the voice of so many other things. Maybe instead of turning God's voice up, we need to turn other voices down. I was in prayer one time, and, and I realized, I was like, Lord, I, I, need to, I need some clarity, you know. I need some clarity. I need some direction. I need, I need an answer. I need, some, I need a revelation in this area of my life. And then... I walk out of my prayer time, and I put in my earbuds, and I go work out, and I'm listening to some music, and then I'm driving, and I got an audio book on, and, and, I'm, and I'm listening to some podcasts, you know, and I'm, I'm doing voice notes as I'm going to try to make sure I'm connecting, and I'm not missing any, any things, I'm returning voicemails, I'm doing all of these things, and I keep doing that, I keep doing that, I keep doing that, and then again, I go into prayer the next day, I'm like, Lord, I just haven't heard you clearly. Lord, I just need a revelation. I need you to speak to me in this. Lord, what's my assignment for this situation? And then I walk out, and then I'm doing phone calls, <laughs> right? I'm doing all these things. I'm like, Lord, why aren't you speaking to me? He's like, I'm trying. And it occurred to me, I was like, there's nothing wrong with audiobooks. There's nothing wrong with podcasts. There's nothing wrong with Christian music. But sometimes we can fill our ears with so much stuff that God can't even get in there. You know, it's almost like we're trying to be more sent. It's like this. It's like we're like, Lord, I just come come into the room. I don't. I just want to feel you. I just want to feel you. And He's like, I'm right here. I'm right here. And we're like, Lord, I just want to feel you. I just want to know that you're with me. Oh Lord, where are you? And He's like, I'm behind you. <laughs> How many know? Sometimes we're just more aware of so many other things than we are of Him. So it's not a matter of Him leaving. It's just a matter of us not being aware that He's there over the over all the other things. 
Are you, are you picking up what I'm putting down? <sighs> okay. And it's interesting, and, I, and I've been this before. I, I've, I have been a lazy Christian, all right? This, can I tell you what lazy Christianity is from my own personal experience? It's I don't want to invest in that. I don't want to take the time that it takes to cultivate a personal relationship with God, so I would rather you do it, and I'll listen to your sermon. Guilty as charged. People are like, hey, Jake, how's your prayer life going? Oh, it's, it's okay, it's okay. Hey, can you give me some direction? I've been trying to get a, the word from the Lord on this, but I can't seem to get it. But I haven't really been listening, <laughs> you know. How many know the message that you listen to Saturday night, Sunday morning, or from your favorite preacher on your favorite podcast is meant to complement your relationship with God, not replace it? Sometimes, and, and this is funny, I feel like Americans, we're just, we do this instinctively because we have so many things at our disposal. And maybe it's not because we're American. Maybe it's just because it's the 21st century. But, like, it's kind of like when you get cereal. There's so many options, you know what I mean? It's kind of like that. It's like um, um, people who want to live healthier. Where's Brittany? She can probably relate to this. Okay, so people want to eat healthy, and they're like, Brittany, what supplement should I get? Right? And it's like you're, you're thinking, okay, if I tell you what supplements to get and you don't stop eating cheeseburgers, we're going to have a big issue here. Not only are you going to be out a lot of money, but you're going to be frustrated and think nothing's going to work for you, and then you'll start believing a lie that you're just not meant to be healthy, that you were just born this way. Right? Yeah. She's like, preach it! <laughs> well, sometimes we do that in our relationship with God unintentionally. You know? We're like, oh, i got to listen to a message. I've been listening to tons of sermons. I've been listening to tons of audio books. But what if we took more time? to just sit in our prayer room and just listen to the voice of God than we did listening to podcasts. Now, I'm not coming down on you. I'm just coming from experience here, okay? Like, I live this. God desires to speak to us. He desires to speak to us. When he says here, when he says, you are already clean, that word clean comes from, or excuse me, the word prune comes from that word clean in the Greek. So he's like, you are already pruned. You are already clean. You are already unmixed because of the word that I spoke to you. It's kind of like it's kind of like this. If I can give you just one more analogy, um, it's like, have you ever been in your house and uh, your spouse is in you're in the, your spouse is in the kitchen and you're in the living room, right? And the radio's playing like some some uh, World Harvest worship music. Right, and then on the TV you got Pastor Shar's message from last week, and and you're vacuuming at the same time, and then all of a sudden your your spouse is in the kitchen, she she's cooking or he's cooking, and he has the exhaust fan on above the stove, and then starts blending things, and then they're like, hey, uh, yeah, yeah. and you're like, what, what? I can't hear you. I can you? I I I have no idea what you're saying right now. It's pretty. Speak up. Speak up. What? Anybody? You're like, no, we're way smarter than that, right? No, but that's what, that's what happens. That's what happens. When in reality, it's not the person needs to speak louder. It's, hey, turn off the TV, turn off the radio, turn off the fan, stop cooking for a minute, put the vacuum away, and just talk to each other. I wonder if sometimes in our lives we're going through everything and we're like, we're doing all these different things. We're meeting with people. We're making phone calls. We're, we're thinking about all of these relationship things we're trying to do. You know, I don't know. You know what I mean. We have all these world things that are happening because we have to live our lives, right? And then we're like, God, just speak louder. Just speak louder. I can't hear you. And he's like, just turn the things down. Just turn the things down. And how many know when we hear his voice, he cleans us. He cleans us. And if you want to get better or more fluent at hearing the voice of God. Raise your hand if you want to be more fluent in hearing the voice of God. Good, good, good. Me too. If we want to be a student of the voice of God, we must first become a student of the word of God. If you want to be fluent in hearing his voice, you got to be fluent in knowing his word. I look at our pastors, I'm like, man, they just like, they can hear the voice of God like on command. And sometimes I'm like, jeez, what happened to me? <laughs> but they know their word. They know the word. I look at Bobby Connor and the guy, I mean, he's a prophet to the nations, like legitimate prophet to the nations. If that makes you uncomfortable, I don't know what to tell you, but prophet to the nations, like, hey, CIA, there's a backpack in this stadium with a bomb in it. You might want to go check it out. Have a good day. I'm going to go fishing. That kind of prophet. 
he hears the voice of God clearly, but guess what? He's memorized the whole Bible. It's amazing. It's amazing. Okay, should I stop meddling? Okay, let's, uh, can we start over from verse 1? Okay. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. How many know he wants you to bear more fruit? He wants you to bear fruit more than you do. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Here we go, verse 4. This might be my favorite part. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. All right, I'm just going to tell you. The word abide in the Greek, it means it's meno, meno, I think. It means not to depart. Isn't that something? I always thought abiding meant like, okay, okay, really, really work hard. Just pray and just focus and really think hard. Anybody ever do that? You go in your prayer room, you're like, oh, pray. No, nobody, just me. But I, I'm just like, I'll be trying and like fighting and just struggling through it. And he's like, no, no, abiding isn't trying real hard. It's just not leaving. It's just not leaving. It says, do not depart, or not to depart, not to leave, to continue to be present. Watch this. To maintain unbroken fellowship with one. That's what it means to abide. He says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Now here's what's fascinating to me. Where does the vine come from? The ground, it develops roots, right? How many know he is the root? Huh? He's the root. He comes up, he's the vine. He's coming up through the ground, he's breaking forth. And where does the branch come from? Out of the vine. Say, I'm a branch. Okay, so if you're a branch and Jesus is the vine, where did you come out of? Did, did, was Jesus just like strolling through the garden? And he's like, oh, a branch. Or actually, that would be more literal, right? Is that how that happened? No, it says that, okay, listen, I'm just going to preach for a second. John 1, 1 says this, in the beginning was the, and the word was with God, and the word, he was in the beginning with, and in verse 3 it says this, what does it say? Anybody know it? Anybody know it? John, no, just verse 3, John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Th yes, through him all things were made. Nothing was made without, or, I better just read it. <laughs> My body temperature is rising. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Interesting that the Word's a he, huh? How many know he is the word? Okay, good. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. How, how many in here are a thing? Am I talking to any things? Okay, all things were made through him. You were literally, you, your existence was not some cosmic accident. You were not a biological coincidence. Your existence was actually lying within the very heart of Jesus Christ before the foundation of the world. So the vine, he broke through the ground, and all of a sudden you came up out of that vine. You, your existence was in him. In Ephesians 2.10, for example, it says, For we are his workmanship, or his masterpiece, created where? In Christ. Not just by, but in Christ, to do good works which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God has things specifically for you, specifically for you to walk in. Sometimes in life, I think we just are too focused on living by our feelings rather than living off of the, based off of the truth. It's, it's all over the culture, right? But can I just say, you are not your feelings? I said you are not your feelings. If you, listen, if you feel like lying, it doesn't mean you're a liar, right? You're like, oh, I don't want to tell the truth. I'll look bad. I have this temptation, this feeling to lie. It doesn't make you a liar, Right? If you have a feel like I feel like stealing something, I really need that and I can't afford it, I gotta get ahead. It doesn't make you a thief. 
Listen, if you're a girl and you feel like you're a boy, it doesn't mean you're actually a boy. If you feel like you're, if you're a guy and you feel attracted to another guy or a girl attracted to another girl, it doesn't mean that you're homosexual. You're not your feelings. You're not. You are, your feelings don't determine who you are. Jesus does. The word does. Can somebody shout amen? Oh, my heart's racing. I don't even know where I'm at anymore. Yeah, biting. Sometimes we want to produce fruit so bad that we lose sight of where it comes from. We can't grab fruit from others and try attaching it to our branch. <laughs> you imagine that? You're walking through a apple yard or something. or Imagine somebody walking through an apple yard and there's like oranges over here. Maybe there's oranges over there and there's like apples over here. And you pick up an orange and they like try to attach it to the apple tree. What would you say to that person? Go get some counseling. <laughs> right? Go see Wendy Musk because she's a pro. <laughs> no, that, that, why? Because that's ridiculous. Why is it in the church that we look at other people's fruit and we try to put it on us and we're like, why don't I have that fruit? No, just let, just, here's the thing. You don't even produce the fruit. The only reason you even lay, can lay claim to your fruit is because you're abiding. Where do the nutrients for the fruit come from? from the vine. They go up from the root system, up through the vine, out through the branches, and then they go to the fruit. You literally can't take any credit for that. All, all This is the biggest amount of credit you can say. I let him. I don't know. I just, I just didn't leave. I don't know. I just stayed here. That's about it. For real, we, we can't take any credit. And so we should not live our lives trying to compare our fruit to other people. We just need to abide in Christ and let him produce the fruit that he wants you to produce. Because how many know your fruit isn't even for you? Your fruit is for people to come by and eat it. If somebody chews on your finger, that's not what I'm saying, okay? <laughs> that is an infant. <clears throat> if you're connected to a false vine, you're going to bear thistles and thorns. And how many know that doesn't affect you? That affects everybody that runs into it. But if you're connected to the true vine, you bear supernatural fruit that when somebody comes by your life and they spend time with you, it blesses them. When somebody from your job spends time with you and they have no hope for their marriage, but all of a sudden you share with them, hey, you know what, my marriage was tough too, but we leaned on Jesus and he got us through. And instead of getting a divorce, we had a second honeymoon. If he did it for me, he'll do it for you. All of a sudden, they're like, whoa, I needed that. Are you seeing what I'm saying? Your fruit isn't for you. It's for your coworkers. It's for your neighbor. It's for your boss. It's for the team that you lead. But we must abide. Say, I'm going to abide. Say, I have no choice but to abide. Oh, he is the vine. The vine stretches down into the ground and has an entire root system that gathers and collects the life-giving nutrients that are necessary to produce fruit. In Psalm chapter 1, no, I don't know if I gave you this either. Did I give you anything? Psalm 1. Can I just read one more verse to you? I pray that this is speaking to somebody. I know it's been speaking to me. Have you ever been talking to somebody and everything you said to them was just for you? And you're like, that was really good advice. <laughs> And then you're taking notes in the bathroom stall. You're like, oh, God, I needed that. Oh, my Lord, I just, I'm so thankful. It's the best thing ever. We can't lay claim to any, any sort of fruit or revelation. It all comes from him. It all comes from him. So there's no room for pride. <laughs> That's why Paul's like, I boast in my weakness. Because in my weakness, his strength is made perfect. So if you see a lot of fruit in somebody's life, it's probably because they're really weak. <laughs> in and of themselves. Maybe we should be a little less strong, a little more weak.
This is just cool. I just want to share this with you, and then we'll get out of here. Uh, can I get somebody on the piano, Amy, please? This is Psalm 1. This is awesome. It says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners. How many of you has a path for you? And it's not a path of wickedness. It's not a path of emptiness. It's a path of life. It's a path of fruit. It's a path of abundance. Nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. If I can just tell you mathematically, how many know Jesus did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it? So when you're reading and you see the law, mathematically, you can insert Jesus. So if I were to say that, knowing New Testament, knowing Jesus, our Savior, it could read, and his law, or excuse me, and in Jesus he meditates day and night. But his delight is not, excuse me, I'm going to start over. Is that okay? Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in Jesus. And in Jesus, he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree. There it is. You see that? He said he shall be like a tree. Planted by the rivers of water. That bring forth its fruit in season. Whose leaf also shall not wither. And whatever he does shall prosper. Does that sound good for anybody? <laughs> Does anybody in here want to be like that tree? Does anybody in here want to be planted by rivers of water? Does anybody want to be planted by rivers of living water? Does anybody want to bring forth fruit in the right season? Does anybody want to have a leaf that never withers, no matter if it's winter, summer, fall, or spring? Woo, I do. Do you want everything that you do to prosper? Oh, I know I do. Well, who is it? It's the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. It's the man who does not stand in the path of sinners. Doesn't mean he doesn't go rescue people from other paths. Sinners' paths. Are you, did you catch that? Or did I say that stupidly? You don't stand there. You don't dwell there. But you can go rescue somebody out of theirs. I can't remember the, event or the missionary that said, I wish not to set up camp with an earshot of Chapel Bell but I wish to set up a rescue mission within a yard of hell. No, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. If I could just add a New Testament, new covenant, thanks to Jesus, if you want to be like that man or that woman, just abide. Just abide. How do we know it's the vine that lifts you up? If you're a branch, you don't have to try to go higher. The vine will take you. I mean, you don't have to try to reach out further. The, the vine will support that. How I many know you get to just be the canopy that the vine holds up? Hallelujah. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and are burned. I think we need to hear this more often. How many know there's a heaven and there's a hell? And how many know if somebody doesn't give their life to Jesus, hell is their destination? Sometimes we want to see in the spirit. Oh, God, open my eyes so I can see in the spirit like the prophet's servant so I can see the chariots of your army all around me. Well, if we could truly see in the spirit, you know what you'd see? You'd probably beg them to close your eyes because you'd walk into marketplace and you'd see nothing but people walking with chains all around their all around their wrists, all around their, their ankles. You'd see a cloud of confusion around people's minds. You'd see a lying mouth talking into the ears of so many people, and your heart would just break like Jesus did when he said he looked, when it says that he looked on the crowd and he had compassion because they looked like a sheep or they looked like sheep without a shepherd. Are you hearing me? We need to be aware of this. If we really get this, then we would never keep our mouth shut. 
If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. How many know when you're connected to him, you get his desires? How many know when you abide in him, your desires become replaced? (laughs) All of your worldly wants become kingdom wants. Right? I think it says, delight yourself in the law, Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. Right? I don't think it means if you desire a really, you know, big mansion so you can just sit in your castle and never talk to anybody. (laughs) I think it means that he will actually give you new desires in your heart. He'll give you the desires of your heart. He'll take out your empty desires and give you life-giving ones. I know you're bored. We'll get out of here. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. I mean, oh, that's because you're connected to him. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit so you will be my disciples. Will you stand with me? You bearing much fruit brings glory to God. Did you know that? Your fruit, when when you're a fruity man, (laughs) when you're a fruity woman, bearing the kingdom fruits, fruits of the kingdom, fruits of the spirit, when you're bearing those, those fruits, you're literally giving God glory. Does anybody in here want to give God glory? Does anybody want to live a life that God looks at and he's like, I can trust that one? Oh, I can use that one. Well, I'll tell you what, he really is eager to use you. And all you got to do to be in that place of bearing fruit and bringing him glory, all you got to do, abide. That's all you got to do. Can you close your eyes for a moment? Some in here and some watching online, you have been abiding in an, in a wrong vine. You've been connected to a different vine, a different source, and you recognize that because of the fruit in your life. You notice that your fruit, it's like kingdom fruit is almost non-existent. And you're literally bearing thorns and thistles where almost it seems like everybody that comes around you just gets hurt. When everybody comes around you, they just get wounded. And you're like, my gosh, maybe I should just give up. I feel like I'm not giving, I'm just not doing this right. I don't know. I don't know. No, my friend, just, just be grafted into the true vine. Just be grafted into the true vine. And Jesus tonight wants to do that for anyone. For anyone that feels like you have been not abiding in him. If that's you, I just want you to put your hand on your heart. Jesus sees the slightest movement. He sees sees you clearly. And we're all just going to pray together. Say, Lord Jesus, I repent for abiding in the wrong vine. And I choose tonight to abide in you. You are the author of life. And you're the one that gives life and life more abundantly. So that's where I choose to go and to not leave. Today I choose to remain, to abide in you. So, Lord, I thank you for your people. Lord, I thank you for their hearts. I thank you for their passion for you. I pray that even in agreement with the passage that my wife read tonight out of Revelation, Lord, that we would return to our first love. And, Lord, that we would do what 2 Corinthians 7 says and that we would get rid of all of the things that contaminate us. It's fascinating that your word says not just your spirit but your body. Lord, teach us how to do that, how to not contaminate our bodies and our spirits, Lord. May this church be a church that's known as spiritually whole people who don't just know about God, but actually know Him. Don't worry, my friend. He's just, in fact, even right now, I just feel like he's pruning He's purging. Even even maybe with some of the stuff that's been said tonight, it landed somewhere inside of you, and you're like, I don't know what that was, but I think I needed to hear that. No, you did. And it's the Lord. It's the Lord working in you. He's unmixing all of the good from the bad. He can separate the water from the oil real easy. And he's just pruning hearts right now. He's pruning hearts. He's just 
He's, he's cutting off thorny branches. All of those branches where you feel like you just hurt people, no, no, no more. Not, not after tonight. Not after tonight. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I pray that as we go tonight, we are very well aware of you as the lion that's walking with us. Lord, that we wouldn't try so hard to try to muster something up, but that we would just trust you're right there. You're right there. Help us to learn how to turn down the voice of all the other things so that we can hear you clearly. Like Elijah in the cave where it wasn't the fire, it wasn't the earthquake, it wasn't the thunder, it was a still, small whisper. Lord, we want to be able to be sensitive to that. So Lord, I even pray right now by your Holy Spirit that you would reveal any noise sources in our lives that we need to turn down. In Jesus' name, some in here need to turn off the news. You actually need to turn it off and take, take some time away from the news. Don't worry. You're not going, you, you'll be uninformed of the bad news, but you'll be refilled with the good news. Amen. Some of you need to do that. You know who you are. Thank you for it, Lord. Some need to, to, need to unplug from games on your phone. Oddly enough, that has been a noise source for you. Sorry, I know I don't want to be I don't want to be too long or anything. I just feeling these things here. And some of us need to this is a weird one, but expectations, I don't know if that rings true for anybody. Uh, expectations of people or maybe uh, maybe even a spouse, I don't know, but it's like you feel like there are these expectations on you and that has been too noisy. You need to turn that down. The Lord will show you how to do that. Yeah, Lord, I just pray that you continue to reveal things as we go. You're amazing. He who the sun sets free is free indeed. So we thank you, Lord. You're awesome, and we love you. Take the hand of somebody next to you and just pray for them like you'd want them to pray for you. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, pray violently like there's a lion next to you. That's not violent enough. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. You don't need a word of knowledge. Just pray. Pray. Lord, we bless each one in this place. We bless each one in this place. We bless everything that they set their hand to, that it would prosper and bring you glory. Lord, I thank you that this church will be a fruitful church and that the people of Rice Lake and of Eau Claire and of Chippewa and of Siren and all around this region will find that when they come to these people, they find life because Jesus is in them. Lord, that they will encounter you, the Lion of Judah, just by talking to one of your, your loved ones, your children. Lord, we thank you for it. Thank you, Lord, for reigniting the fire in our souls and in our spirits. You're wonderful, you're wonderful, you're wonderful. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody shout it. Amen. Amen. All right, before you leave, give somebody a hug. And if you don't like hugs, then just don't hug them. <laughs>